Well, he started boxing in Louisville, Kentucky, with a policeman who he'd met whilst he was looking for his stolen bike. But he also trained in New York. Nick Bryant joins us live from Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn, where he continues to inspire new generations, Nick. Absolutely, and what better tribute for Muhammad Ali than a full boxing gym on the morning of his death? Uh, Gleason's was the gym, the most famous gym in New York, the most famous gym in America, where he trained as a fighter. And as I say, young people here are paying tribute to Ali by getting in the ring and training. Uh, New York was also where he had some of his most famous fights, at Madison Square Garden, of course. And I've been speaking to friends who loved and admired Muhammad Ali. <laughs> New York's most famous boxing gym also doubles as a shrine to Muhammad Ali. He trained at Gleason's in the 1960s, where his supersized charisma made him an electrifying presence. But it's not just as a megastar that they remember him here. It's also as a friend. I mean, he would do anything that he would do anything for. He'd help you as much as he can. Uh, he'd take, give you the shirt off his back. He just was that nice of a guy. He's just a nice person, period. And he stop and talk to anybody. He'll stop. He, he'll not only stop and talk to the guy with the standing in the corner with the suit and tie on. He'll talk to the bum that's laying on the ground, half drunk or half dead. He'll stop and talk. You know what? If you start talking to him, he'll talk to you. One thing about Muhammad Ali, he loved to talk. There are two things that are hard to hit and see. That's the spooky ghost and Muhammad Ali. Hey! <laughs> People would queue up even to watch Ali train. And at a time when boxing was in danger of being relegated to a backstreet sport, he ushered in its golden age. And it wasn't about the money or the fame. His star power could fill arenas the size of Madison Square Garden a hundred times over. But it was the intimacy that photographer Michael Gaffney recalls. He spent a year on the road with Ali in the late 1970s and has special memories of a trip to South America, where Ali toured hospitals filled with polio victims and lent a helping hand to the poor. Every day uh, that we were there, there were beggars lined up in the hallway. And he would, so, he gave each one of them a hundred dollar bill. And I said, champ, why, why are you doing that? And he said, because $100 here is worth $10,000 at home, and that was him. Ali was a sportsman who almost defies description. Champion, superstar, icon, the superlative seem inadequate. But his own famous boast also serves as an epitaph. He was, quite simply, the greatest. Well, let's talk about Ali's great legacy to the sport of boxing with Bill Silverglade, who is the owner of this iconic gym. Bill, it's worth remembering that Ali came along at a time when boxing almost was on its knees. Uh, he, he came through when boxing was on its knees, and, and the country, the United States, was uh, in a lot of turmoil. You know, the civil rights movement was going on, the Vietnam War was going on. So he came through at a time when um, it was right for him to become the most famous person in the world and, and become an icon. I, I don't think we can duplicate uh, Muhammad Ali today. Uh, there'll, there'll never be another person uh, that can do what Ali did. But do young kids come through your doors wanting to be Ali? Are they Absolutely. still inspired by him? Totally, yeah. Ali actually changed the style of boxing. Uh, prior to Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, we had good champions in here. We had Jake LaMotta. He fought uh, Sugar Ray Robinson five times. They were wars. They were bloody. Their hands were up. Uh, they continued to walk forward and get, uh, get beat one another. Uh, Ali's changed all that. He said, no, I don't want to get beat up. I don't want to have a bloody nose. He used his speed and his style to move around the ring, back off from punches. Uh, his detractors actually called him a coward. Uh, but he wasn't a coward. His style uh, uh, was a winning style. He became a three-time heavyweight world champion. And today, uh, his legacy lives on. Now, everybody that comes into the gym wants to train like uh, Ali, not like uh, Jake LaMotta. Do you think the way that he fought contributed in many ways to his Parkinson's, that rope dope style, that willingness to take punishment? I know you're not a doctor, but you know, you know boxing. 
I know boxing very well, and, and I have to tell you, you know, it, it's a rough sport, and uh, some people uh, get uh, different forms of dementia. I do not believe that Parkinson's disease is, uh, uh, is part of it. Uh, there are many, many people that have Parkinson's disease that never uh, boxed in a ring. Uh, so uh, again, I, I'm not being a doctor, and I don't want to say he didn't take punches to the head, but um, you don't get uh, Parkinson's disease from, uh, from boxing. Uh, I have a program, a free program, a uh, charity here where I have 50 people that have Parkinson's disease trained here. And it's a tremendous improvement for them. It helps them out a lot. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say that um, uh, that Ali's disease uh, is a result of boxing. That's sure. Bill, it's been a special time to be in your gym today. Thank you Thank very you. much for Thanks speaking for to here. us. Okay. Thank you for letting Thanks us in. Um, as I say, what better tribute to Ali than a boxing gym that is full of young fighters trying to box the way that he did. Back to you in the studio. Nick, thank you very much indeed.